Hello and welcome to TNWKS, the Now We Know show, the show where we discuss a topic of interest and by the end we will have learned something new and hopefully you will too. I'm Zach. And I'm Buzz. And in this week's episode, we are following the Christmas theme and we are going to be discovering all about Beowulf Day. If you enjoy the Now We Know Show podcast, support Zach World Productions on Patreon or join our members on YouTube for early access, ad-free content and exclusive episodes. However, before we start finding out all there is to know about Beowulf Day and what it's got to do with the festive season, it's time for... You guessed it. Weird and Wonderful! And this week's Weird and Wonderful, I've brought it in, and it's the first ever Florida Man Games to feature... Beer belly wrestling and evading arrest obstacle course. Sorry, what what the heck was that? So you have to say that again. I didn't quite understand what that that was. <laughs> okay, so um, there's, there's, take it step by step. Okay, there's a new Florida Man Games going to be starting in February next year. Okay, and uh, organizers of the Florida Man Games describe the competition as the most insane athletic showdown on earth. Wow, that is a bold statement. Exactly. The games will poke fun at Florida's reputation for producing strange news stories involving guns, drugs, booze, and reptiles, <laughs> or some combination of the four. Wow. Wow. <laughs> there we go. Wow. Among the contests planned for next February in St. Augustine, or Augustine, Florida, according to the organisers, there are the Evading Arrest Obstacle Course in which contestants jump over fences and through yards while being chased by real police officers. Oh, my goodness. The category... <laughs> that's funny. The category five cash grab, in which participants try to grab as much money in a wind-blowing booth. <laughs> and the self... It's like something out of Crystal Maze. And the self-explanatory beer belly wrestling. Beer belly wrestling. Yes. <laughs> this isn't just a competition. It's a one-of-a-kind Florida... I don't know how you say this. Floridian, Florid, Floridonian, Floridonian spectacle. There we go. <laughs> wow. There we go. Oh, so, I wonder. I wonder how uh, beer belly wrestling is conducted. Do you reckon it's in like a ring, or are you standing on like a platform oh, and kind of pushing against someone? I have no idea. Could it? Could it be like Viking wrestling, perchance? Uh, well, yeah. They, I've, I've been. I've done that before and fell foul of somebody's beer gut. Wow, maybe that's the thing. Uh, yeah, maybe that's where it originated. Yeah, unfortunately, it was a bit, it was more of kind of like the budget Viking form of shield wrestling. Okay, <laughs> how, how how did that? We should have undertake. had two shields. Yep. On the floor. Proper shields. Proper shields. Viking shields. Well, te- yeah. Ideally, you'd be on the grass because uh-huh. the handles would sink into the grass. Okay? Right. But because we were inside a hall when we okay. were doing these Viking games. Um, we had to have just round circles, but the organisers had forgotten one, so we only had one shield. Oh. Okay, so the idea is you have two shields, yeah. which are basically touching rim to rim, flat on the floor. <laughs> rim to rim. Yeah, it's funny. Say that. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> You've got the two shields on the floor, so make it like a figure of eight, yeah? Yeah. And one warrior stands on one, and huh. one warrior stands on the other, and then you put your palms flat against each other. Okay, we're, we're, we're doing that, we're in, doing the that in the studio. Okay. You Around bra- the mic. You brace yourself with your feet. Okay, I'm bracing. And then basically you've got to push and try and weave and out bob. Outmaneuver. Outmaneuver and cast the opponent so they at least step off or get thrown off their shield. Oh. Unfortunately, at the Viking Games, it was the world's strongest Viking Games in uh, the city of York. Um, the organisers, are saying, only had one circle that they brought. <laughs> and so it meant that competitors had to stand on the one shield. Oh, how do you fit two fully grown Vikings on one shield? It's difficult, okay? And, uh, and the Vi- Breathe in! <laughs> it, it was like that. And the Vi- breathe out! The Viking uh, I had, had had a bit of a tummy. And uh, so we were sort of just getting on the shield and put our hands together, and then he sort of like pushed forward with his stomach, and I stepped backwards, and then it was like, what point? And it's like, hang on, have we even started yet? <laughs> Calm it down, Calm it Calm down, on. guys. And uh, and it was like, and he did it twice, and it was like, this is ridiculous because I come hardly on the shield. You have no purchase. No, no purchase. No skill. Just so I was, I was, I, I actually <sighs> lost two one to to the to oh, the, to my opponent's stomach, but I still came. Uh, I still basically, I came second in the overall tournament, but mm-hmm. I was 
I was named the people's champion. I think you did have quite the so, fan base there. Yeah, I did. I you was did. the people's you champion, the strongest Viking. And who who were you, the Viking? Oh, me. Yes. I am uh, uh, Ufgarda, Ra- Raudaskig, basically. Nice. Redbeard. Awesome. Yeah. Anyway, we're kind of, st- kind of, yeah, I suppose it's kind of on track yeah, of what we're yeah, talking definitely, about. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so there you are, just saying, the weird and wonderful is this Florida Games, <laughs> beer the belly wrestling. Beer belly wrestling. And uh, trying to outrun police officers in the, <laughs> in that, the, evade, the evade obstacle course. Which I, I mean, I, didn't ne- I could never think that you'd be able to like make that like a sport. Well, there you go. well <laughs> let's face it. Maybe England, that's, that's America. In UK, we do cheese rolling, we do shin kicking. And people know. think we're mad. Yeah, yeah, we do all sorts of stuff. Uh, so anyway, so good on you, Florida. Get to it. So anyway, this week, Beowulf Day. Beowulf Day. So, Beowulf so Day. what is Beowulf Day? Right, I think maybe we should start with, first of all, what is Beowulf? And I'm sure okay. a lot yeah. of people out there have heard of Beowulf. Uh, maybe they are scholars and have mm-hmm. read Beowulf, or maybe they know Beowulf simply through films or TV yeah, shows. Yeah, popular media, like. yeah. But cool. for those people, because this is the Now We Know show and we want to learn things, uh, Beowulf is a very, very, very ancient Anglo-Saxon poem all about a heroic warrior mm-hmm. whose name is Beowulf. Beowulf. Uh, in fact, it was written down uh, over a thousand years ago. Wow. It's the oldest existing piece of Anglo-Saxon written Literature. Literature. Wow, that is amazing. It actually was in a library, the Cotton Library, in, I think it was the 1700s, can't think of the date off the top of my head, um, where the library virtually burnt down. Oh, no. And it actually is scorched. Wow, the original text. The original text, because this original text from over a thousand years ago, almost, we didn't have it now. Wow. Just imagine, like, even with that kind of notion, like... Obviously, it was in a fire, and that was one of many texts oh. within this archive of yeah, things. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, we could go into another podcast all about the lost history of mankind, because you've mm. you you know you've heard probably heard of the Library of Alexandria. Or yes, like I was going to bring um, that up. Which was burnt to the ground. And you, it, this is just an example of one piece of literature, mm. one story of epic proportion, yeah. of heroism, which is equal to any kind of modern... Um, you know, uh, heroes you'd have oh, yeah. in our own pop, film, in our own pop TV, culture, whether it be Superman, books, novels, whatever, everything, you know? comics. Uh, yeah, you can bring Beowulf right up to date, and, and basically, even though this uh, actual text was written over a thousand years ago, mm-hmm. it's equal to any kind of superhero um, comic stories, films, uh, graphic novels that you'd have yeah, exactly. today. Yeah. Um, anyway, so you have this written down, but although it was written down, and it's a story um, that revolves around the Geats, which were a uh, Scandinavian, the lower part of Sweden tribe. So basically, you're looking at if, if you imagine Viking warriors mm-hmm. uh, and Danish Vikings as well. So sort of Denmark and Sweden. The story itself, when you read it, it has got a lot of Christian connotations that have been written in it by the. St- Scribe who's, who's obviously writing it down. It is probably, an, and we don't know who wrote Beowulf down. I mean, it's being a thousand years old, it, that we, is. We don't know what that is, the actual that is real story, history. We don't know what the story was actually called because there's no title to it. So right. it's become so it's known, become known it as Beowulf, Beowulf after based upon the, the character. main character in it. Oh wow, that's really and interesting. We don't know who wrote it, but probably I'm guessing at the time it probably would have been maybe a monk or somebody along those lines because obviously it was the monks that would write do all they of could the, write the scribing and, and yeah. do all the all the scribing yes anyway so you've got this fantastic story but the, my point is that it probably wasn't a new story when it was being written down because you have this mix of uh, fantasy mm. in that you have the story of a warrior and he's doing these most epic things and he's having to fight Grendel who is uh, the main monster in the in the story antagonist in the first half i mm-hmm. mean there's basically three three monsters if you like it in it grendel's the main one because grendel has uh, he's like um uh, from from the 
marshes. Like a kind of like a troll. Well, troll. I, I if you read it, I, I always got the impression that he was like a, a marsh beast, kind of covered in hair. He's, he's described as having steel-like talons. Right. You know, fire coming from his eyes. And right. Things, and he, he he dwells within the marshes. Cause that's really yeah. interesting. Cause obviously, I'm a bit more familiar with. Obviously, the modern movies. Yeah, well, we'll get to the movies. Yeah. Okay, where the depiction in that yeah. is a lot a, different to what few, you just there's, described. There's a few different depictions, but in the story, he is, has got these big talons. I imagine him to be kind of a, like a almost like a, a werewolf type of creature. Yeah. Wow, with, really? With teeth and these steel-like claws, mm. bigger. You know, mm. uh, and he, as I say, he dwells within the marshland and yeah. in the mists. Um, a bog monster. <laughs> a bog monster. But there's also his mother, that you hear about later in the story, mm-hmm. who so when uh, and I'll do a reading uh, shortly, um, but his mother uh, is an ogress and she also lives deep in the waters, and uh, they know nothing about her. So when Beowulf, what happens is uh, King Hrothgar of the Danes, in, to sum this up quickly, he builds. Uh, he's a he's a very important king and yeah. a, and, a, and, a, and a warrior himself. He, you know, he is a. They call him a ring giver. You know, he, basically, he he gives out golden rings to, uh, you know, his best warriors and, and 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 his chieftains and things. And it's from the ring giving that authors like Tolkien take their inspiration when talking about oh, the rings. What? Oh, what uh, in Lord of the Rings? In Lord of the Rings. Wow. Uh, it's from these stories where. Yeah, people are, again like Tolkien takes a lot of things from the Anglo-Saxon, from Beowulf, and from other stories with the dragons and things like this that, that get mixed into. So it's very much like a, a basis for yes. modern well, fantasy when literature. When you take uh, when you take Tolkien, he um, he obviously was a scholar in ancient Anglo-Saxon. Yes, so, of course, yeah. yeah. And he put an awful lot of that into his stories. Mm. And so Hrothgar, um, because he's this very um, successful successful king. Very, very important days, king, yeah. He decides to build this golden hall of Herot. So this big, gigantic mead hall, which is scaled in gold. And it's very reminiscent to um, Valhalla, the golden hall of the gods, if you like. Right, so right. Kind of, okay. Uh, going there's very kind of much, a reflection yeah. there of uh, where you talk about Valhalla and how uh, the roof is made of golden slates or shields on the roof and... Um, you know, it gives you that impression. But anyway, the, this hall is so grand mm-hmm. and so mighty, and he's uh, such a fantastic, you know, respected king of the Danes. But unbeknownst to King Hrothgar, is out in the marshlands because we're living in a time where there's still demons and monsters and things. And this is mm. kind of where it kind of crosses over the border of Christianity and of paganism because okay. you kind of feel that later on in Christianity, you kind of don't have the fact that you're talking about this kind of you know, marshland creature, monsters and, and ogres, and as the story continues, dragons as well. Right. So uh, it's kind of a bit of a mix. And you get, uh, I get, and I'm sure a lot of other people probably agree with me, that this is a story that was probably passed down through oral tradition. Yeah. To the point. Like folk, folk tales. Folk tales, just like where Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm yep. went around collecting these yep. folk, folk tales. Whoever whoever the author was that wrote down Beowulf mm. may well have collected that story yeah. and then put their as an author put their own, their own spin their own spin on, on it, it because especially if they were a Christian you know, clerical monk or whatever they yeah. would have changed anything to do with the old gods you know of uh, Odin um, and, and Valhalla and, and you know the Viking and, gods basically the the ancient gods of the Vikings and Norse that. mythology yeah. yeah so they would have changed that and put that that Christian spin on it. And so this is a story that probably is much older than that when it was written down. Mm. Um, and it's absolutely amazing that it has managed to survive. This long. This long on its original, obviously original parts when it's on yeah. and survived a fire. Mm. So it still, it still it's exists. The, it's in the British Museum, yes. Wow. You know, and... Um, wow. That is and really so, cool. and so with... With the, maybe this is an opportunity. Shall I, shall I read some for you and the listeners? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay let's, and then, let's... then we can then we can talk more about its connection to Christmas. Yeah, or the festive season. Yes. Okay. Where we take up the story is after the point where Beowulf and his geat warriors have arrived at Herot and have uh, been welcomed by King Hrothgar, and Beowulf has basically told the king that he is there 
to get rid of Grendel, his monster, and to rid the Golden Hall of Herot from this beast once and for all. And so they've had a banquet and welcomed Beowulf and his warriors. And we now are at the point where Beowulf and his men are going to be left in the Hall of Herot. Then was King Hrothgar minded to rest, aware of the monster brooding his attack, from the time when he saw the sun's first light to the time when darkness drowns all things, and under its shadow cover shapes do glide, dark beneath the clouds. The whole assembly rose up. Then did the king, with these words, leave Beowulf. Never have I at any instance to any man thus handed over Herot, as I here do to you. Take, and now hold, to the house of the Danes. Bend your mind and your body, and wake against the foe. Beowulf then replied with a boasting speech, I fancy my fighting strength, my performance in combat, at least as greatly as Grendel does his and therefore I shall not foreshorten his life with a slashing sword. Too simple a business. Of good arms he knows nothing, of the shattering of shields. No, we'll at night play without any weapons. If unweaponed he dare face me in fight, Odin in his wisdom shall apportion the honours then, the All-Father to whichever he thinks fit. Then the hero lay down, while about him many brave sea warriors bent to their hall rest, not one of them thinking ever to see their beloved country again. Gliding through the shadows came the walker in the night. The warriors slept, all except one, and this man kept an unblinking watch. He waited, pent heart swelling with anger against his foe. From off the moorland mists fell came Grendel stalking. He moved through the dark, saw with perfect clearness the gold-panelled hall, mead-drinking place of men. The door gave way to a touch of his hand. Rage-inflamed wreckage bent. He tore the hall's jaws, hastening onwards, angrily advancing. From his eyes shot light in unloving form of fire. He saw in the hall the host of young warriors, and in his heart exulted horrible monster, all his hopes swelling to a gluttonous meal. He meant to divide monstrous in frightfulness the life from each body that lay in that place. As a first step, he set his greedy hands on a sleeping soldier, savagely tore him, gnashed at his bone joints, bolted huge gobbets, sucked at his veins, and had soon eaten all of the man to his fingers and feet. Then he moved forward, reaching to seize our warrior Beowulf, stretched out from him with his spite-filled fist. But the faster man, forestalling, rose up upon his arm and quickly gripped that sickening hand. The upholder of evils immediately knew he had not met on Middle-earth's acres with any other man of a harder hand grasp. He strained to be off. He ailed for his darkness, his company of devils and his den beneath the mere. But Hyglek's brave kinsman recalled his evening's utterance and tightened his hold until fingers burst. The monster strained away. The man stepped closer. The monster's desire was for darkness between them, direction regardless to get out and run for his fen-bordered lair. It was an ill journey that persecutor had of it when he made for Herot that night. It was indeed wonderful that the wine supper hall withstood the wrestling pair, that the world's great palace fell not to the ground, but it was girt firmly both inside and out with iron braces of skilled manufacture. Many a gold-worked wine bench, as we heard it, started from the floor at the struggles of the pair. A thing undreamed of by scalding wisdom was that any of mankind but what method whatsoever might undo that intricate antlered hall, sunder it by strength unless it were swallowed in embrace of fire. Fear entered the Danes as they heard through the side wall the grisly plaint of the enemy of the gods. The sobs of the damned one bewailing his pain. The Geats leapt up to defend their great prince. 
They were ignorant then that no sword on earth, not the truest of steel, could touch their assailant, for every sword edge and weapon of victory he had blunted by wizardry. It was then that the monster moved in spite against our race. Found in the end flesh and bone were to fail him, for Hyglick's great kinsman, stout-hearted warrior, had him fast by the hand, and hateful to each was the breath of the other. A rip in the giant flesh frame showed then, Shoulder muscles sprang apart, a snapping of tendons, bone locks burst, the arm of the demon was severed from his side, and Grendel flew deathsick to his joyless den, where he knew that the end of his life was in sight. Beowulf had cleansed Herot, saved the hall from persecution. As a signal to all, the hero hung the hand, the arm, and torn off shoulder, the entire limb, Grendel's whole grip beneath the soaring roof. Then it was as I heard it. At hall next morning, warrior with warrior walked to see this ghastly limb. The Ulthlings gazed at the hand, high under ceiling. Each nail socket seemed steel to the eye, each spur on the hand was a talon of fear. Of the bright building, just the roof had survived, unmarred and in one piece. Along the wide, high roads, the chiefs of the clans came, crossed remote tracks to follow the foe's footprints, who, with strength flagging, had staggered to his fen lair, giving up his heathen soul there, the death-daubed waters, becrimsoned, seethed, gore-hot, and hell engulfed his life in the deep fen pool. Then the clan chiefs wheeled away from the mere in bold mood, joined by the young men, white-mounted warriors. It was then after, as a sign of victory, Hrothgar, son of Helfden, presented to Beowulf a sword worked in gold, and onto the floor had brought on eight war horses with glancing bridles, one with a saddle studded with stones, battle seat of the Danes. He bade also compensation to be made again in gold for the men whom Grendel had horribly murdered. What a banquet then there was! Gladness mounted, bench mirth rang, the bearers pulled out wine and mead from wonderful vessels. When the evening came, they cleared away the benches, covered the floor with beds and bolsters, the geats placing by their heads their polished shields, the lindens of battle, always ready for war. What a nation they were! Then they sank into sleep, but it was soon made clear a survivor was still living, another foe, grieving, ailing for its loss. In the chilling currents, dwelling in dread waters, the monstrous ogress, Grendel's mother. Yeah, so there we are. There's a, there's a short passage. Well, wow, that, that was Beowulf. amazing. That was um, amazing. And that one is... Uh, from... Well performed, by the way. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, mostly taken from Julian Glover's One Man uh, stage show, Beowulf. We do like uh, Julian, Julian Glover. Julian Glover did an absolutely fantastic uh, one man show, which unfortunately I've never seen the whole thing. Um, but you can go onto YouTube, and if you look up Julian Glover and Beowulf, he does an absolutely fantastic rendition. Uh, of uh, part of the story. Yes, I believe I've seen a good portion yeah. of that. Um, and uh, talking about uh, translations, there are probably over, I mean, well over 60 different translations. Probably the most popular are um, Seamus Heaney's one, as well as uh, Tolkien as he, himself. Did. Wow, he did one. Oh, yeah, he's got a translation of that cool. as well. But there are many translations that probably differ just in little, little bits and pieces. Uh, my own translation of Beowulf is taking out the Christian parts and putting in the Norse. Like re, parts. re, re, re kind of. Yeah, making it feel as if it was from the oral tradition before it was written mm. down. You see, mm. that's what I like. I feel it gives it more of an all traditional, or traditional feeling from from its roots. You know, um, so Beowulf. That's Beowulf. It? It's this this fabulous story of heroism, and in that portion that I just read is when Beowulf defeats Grendel, mm. and it comes to the point where they don't know that Grendel has a mother mm. who then is... That's kind of like a big shocking twist. It's a big twist. She is then completely aggrieved that the fact her son has, has been, been slain. Killed, been slain by Beowulf. And then she then comes back to take revenge. Yeah. And I won't tell you anything more than that at this point. But when that issue is resolved mm -hmm. by Beowulf, um, then the story, he, he goes back to... Geatland, where the geats come from in Sweden, and the story kind of jumps on to when he becomes an old king, right? Uh, and then 
his people are troubled by a dragon at that Ooh, point. Wow. Um, so to kind of sum up, what happens is a, a golden vessel is, is taken from the dragon's lair. And that's when the dragon it starts to cause a lot of issues. And Beowulf is then, as an old man, an old king, for the last time, dons the armour to go into battle to... To defeat the dragon. To, to, to defeat the dragon. And it's interesting because the dragon itself, the reason it's got upset, if you like, yeah. is because part of its dragon's hoard has been taken. Right. It's this one vessel because the dragon lays on the pile of gold, which is... Well, basically, you're talking small, small, small. Small, yeah. Yes, you yeah. see, and it's it's those kind of things. That oh, reflected. that connection to again Tolkien. Tolkien. Um, so yeah, you, know, you have these these things. Well, and again, that, yeah, because that is very much the thing in the Hobbit. Yeah. You have he takes a little goblet, doesn't he? Yes. From from the hoard. From the hoard. Yeah. To, to takes it back to the dwarves. Yeah, exactly. Huh. You see? And it's just that one item. It's those that those connections. It really the is those to connections. Come out and to attack. You know, to start to uh, desolate the land, and then Beowulf has to go and fight him. And unfortunately for Beowulf, that's the last battle he has. He, he, he is victorious, but um, he doesn't survive. You'll have that. to find out. You'll yes. have, to, have to watch some of those movies, read those translations. That's right. But anyway, so Beowulf Day. For those that are scholars of Beowulf, and this is the thing about Beowulf Day. You don't have to be a scholar of Beowulf. You don't mm. have to be... Uh, a person who is like completely nerdy, if you like. About... What are you trying to say? I'm not trying, what to, say, trying to say. <laughs> but you know, people say, "Oh, I don't want to read that. It's in Anglo-Saxon. I don't want to. It's heavy going and things." No, it's, you don't have to. You don't have to. That's the point, especially nowadays, because there are, as we'll discuss shortly, so many different versions. So many that can introduce you to to the whole epic of Beowulf. So it was decided a few years ago that uh, it would be nice to have a day in the year mm -hmm. to celebrate. Beowulf, and not just Beowulf, but the whole idea of kind of like that, um, the winter festival, the mm. time of Yule, you know, to revive the that fact kind that, of Scandinavian origins. Yeah, to get that Scandinavian that kind of well, Viking Scandinavian Anglo-Saxon yeah. feel, because um, when you come to the, the festival of, of Christmas or Yule. Um, depending on how you celebrate it, and that's the thing about Beowulf Day, you can celebrate it however you wish, depending on whether you're a religious person, whether you're not, it doesn't matter. But one of the things that I've found over the years that's kind of been lost through the festive period, especially today, the, the, you know, in the, in the modern times, um, is that Christmas Day is just like now seen as just one day. Yeah. You know, back in the back so, in, it's such a build up, such yeah. a build up, even no, from I, like I, September. I don't September. Have, I don't have stuff on the shelves. I don't have an issue with the build up because I actually really love the festive season. Yeah, but in our family tradition, we celebrate the winter festival, and I tend to shorten that just to call it winter fest. It's but, a good. It's a good term. But winter fest is a bit of a modern term, but I, maybe it fits in more with people's sort of modern approach. But the winter festival of the winter solstice of of Yule. Um, basically, it, in medieval periods, in, in well, in England, you'd celebrate the whole idea of Christmas. It used to last over about a two-week period, mm. and the best, oh, the, for, for one of the reasons behind that was because you've come through autumn, and you've had probably the most bountiful time of the year, with you know produce, and you know fruits and veg and everything else that you've got. Uh, but you're not not all of that is going to get you through winter, or shall I say, not all of that is going to make itself through winter. You can store things, you can put things away, but you're talking about a time where you didn't have a ref refrigeration, you didn't have to, you know, you'd pack maybe apples and things up into your hayloft and cover mm. it in straw and these, you'd, um, you know, uh, salt meat and things to preserve it. Yeah. But you ended up having an excess of food. Yeah which was basically going to go rotten otherwise. So what you'd do is by celebrating the Yule, celebrating the winter solstice, it was a time of feasting and of fun and of songs and of music and dancing, and you would basically eat your way through all that stuff that would otherwise go to waste. Wow. And you'd have this big two... And it, it lasted for about two weeks. Yeah. Now, what I've found in modern times is, as you say, you have that build-up to Christmas. Yeah. And people... Uh, I'm going to use the word Christmas in, in a term that, you know, because Christmas these days you think of, in England, the John Lewis advert. In America, it's probably the Coca-Cola truck yeah. going around. Yeah. All these things. And you have this big build-up. 
pushing it's you, very much commercialized pushing you very commercially to buy this buy this buy buy this, buy buy, this. buy 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 and it has and then you get to christmas day and it's over yep done that's <laughs> the end see and you next the year the poor old uh, family members whether it's the husbands or the wives or whomever that are putting on the christmas dinner are stressing or your family coming around and it's stressful and everything else and you kind of wonder whether the whole idea of chilling out relaxing and saying enjoying yourself you don't have to do it you don't have to stress out you don't have it's to do by it in no one, means one day no see so no. what it is with beowulf day which is the 24th of december so that's christmas eve it's christmas eve Okay, and it comes to different traditions, like, for example, in Germany, Christmas Eve, and in fact, our own royal family still observe this. They have their Christmas on Christmas Eve. Mm. They open their presents on Christmas Eve, whereas we open ours on Christmas Day. Yeah. Um, and th- so you can incorporate both traditional and ancient uh, uh, traditions into a kind of a more modern concept. And for me, I like to try and make the Christmas festival, that winter fest, as something that lasts between yeah. Beowulf Day. In fact, to be honest with you, I kind of get a bit excited. It starts for me on uh, Krampus Krampus night. night. So that's the 5th. That's the 5th uh, through to the 6th. Yeah, okay. so, so the night of the 5th into the 6th of, of December. It's cr- and then when I know we've had Krampus now, it's kind of like, yeah, we're on the road yeah. now to Winterfest. By the way, we did do a Krampus Night yep. um, podcast last year, yeah. so do check that out. So we're on the we're now on the road, as you said, the build up to the Winter Festival. Yes, yes. Um, uh, to you. So as as of time of recording, it is the twelfth of December. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the the excitement's getting there, but the great thing for me and for our family is that uh, it starts on Beowulf Day, mm-hmm. and then lasts all the way through to midnight on New Year's Day. Mm. Okay, yeah. that's that's pretty good because I find that you can celebrate the beginning on Beowulf Day. This mm-hmm. is Christmas Eve. Yep. Have Christmas Day, this or Winterfest Day. Call it what you will. You don't say so it's not from our perspective. It's not a, a religious thing. It's just a festival. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you, you can. It's a time it, to have fun. It's, it's an to, excuse it's, to have fun. It's to put into it whatever you wish. Yeah. But without the pressure of having to buy little Johnny a four hundred pound PlayStation, else he's not going to be happy. You know. Yeah. And he's yeah. going to go around saying books. Books for Christmas? What the heck is that? What the heck is that? No, so it's not... Fo- I don't want books, I it's, want toys. It's not, not focusing on that at all. It's no. focusing about... So we have Beowulf Day, and I'll come back to the, sort of like the mechanics of Beowulf Day in a minute, but then you have Christmas Day, and then we always see family over that winter festival period because we generally have a, that time off ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I've worked for different companies and I've had to work over Christmases and things. And that helps as well because if you're just saying, oh, it's really annoying, everybody else is having fun and I'll, I'm working. If it's just that one day, yeah, it's like you feel like everything's being blown out. It is, it is kind um, of weird um, because obviously on the build up to Christmas, you'd think that work and things like that would actually be winding down for the Christmas period. But in actuality, it gets Busier well, at Christmas, Trump, well, and that I don't, really I, does. I don't know what it's like in other countries, but in the UK, as soon, as you, get soon, soon as you hit Boxing Day, the day after Christmas yeah. Day, it's the sales. Everybody's <laughs> well, there. It's sales, and it's got to get more commercialism. Shop, 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 shop. Forget the fact that you should still be, wherever you can, taking it easy. Enjoying yourself. Enjoying yourself, and still enjoying the feeling of yeah. that winter festival, the, the festive season. Of course. It gets lost. You know, one example for me is when I was a kid growing up, um, we used to like have the Christmas music playing, mm-hmm. and you couldn't. You know, back in them days, yeah, you had BBC One and ITV and BBC Two, and that was about it. But all the way through the Christmas period, mm-hmm. you still had Christmas music being played. Now, of course, these days is that on t- on TV? On TV, uh, uh, and you still felt Christmassy. Yeah. You know? But now you have channels that play Christmas music. Yeah. And so if you want, in the background, on, on Christmas Day itself, you can have Christmas music playing. As soon as Christmas Day is finished, all those channels shut Gone. down. Gone. Yeah. Now it's holiday adverts and go to the sales. Mm. And it's got January of, sales, yeah. Don't like that at all. So the whole idea of Beowulf Day was partially, well, of course, mainly to celebrate Beowulf, uh, the, the epic story, but also to enjoy more of the winter festival yeah. with family and friends and to take it easier and extend it through to New Year. Mm. Otherwise, I mean, I, why not? Why exactly. not? Of course you're going to want to have a you longer know, good time. You know, to celebrate. So instead of making it, this is one day, Beowulf Day is day one and it finishes yeah. 
the winter. I mean, for instance, if you're putting so much so much pressure on that one day, yeah. say something goes wrong, is that then your entire like year ruined well, or that's, something? That, that's what happens. People say, "Oh, you're ruining Christmas. You're ruining Christmas." Because yeah. that pressure is on that the, one day. The pressure's on that one. But day. there's no need for it there's to no be on that one it. day. No, and uh, and so what we do on Beowulf Day is yes, I like to do something connected to Beowulf, which might be a reading, just sitting there in front of the fire. At this point, I will say, if you go onto social media, onto Facebook, mm -hmm. there is a Facebook group called Beowulf Day. Okay. And you can join that, and everybody celebrates Beowulf Day. Oh, wow. That group. That's really cool. And puts up their photos and things. Yeah, I'll have to put a link in the description of this yeah, podcast. So, uh, and, and what it is, is, um, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, okay, we live in a cottage and we have a log burner. Yeah. Other people can have log burners, but I've had people that will go outside into their garden and have a little fire fire box or fire pit mm. and make a fire. Mm. Or even if they've just literally got a candle they can light mm. to have that feeling of turn the lights off and there's that flame. Mm. Yeah. There's that flame that this story was told. Would have been told around, around fire. that fire, yeah. If you can imagine over a thousand years ago. If you can uh, cast your mind well, back. Into an old bower. Into a past. That's it. Into a long, old, long, time ago. Of, you've long got, time ago. You've yeah. got those young children and their parents around a fire. All gathered together. The enjoying the time. Yeah, enjoying the time. And because it's winter outside. It's cold. But they've been feasting. They warm, but they're yeah. warm around that fire. And they're listening to these kind of stories and singing songs and things. And uh, so it's that moment on Beowulf Day to say, yes. Now the winter festival has begun to have that fire, to maybe read a little bit of Beowulf. Mm. Don't have to do that. You don't have to do that at all. If you really don't like re reading Beowulf, then we can move on to other things. But we also combine it with having a feast. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what we do is we just go. Now, that doesn't, again, that doesn't have to be, especially in this cost of living crisis, it doesn't mean that you have to go out and spend loads of money and buy rich cuts of hams and you know, uh, beefs and, and turkeys and whatever and have this big spread because you're going to be having this on Christmas Day the following day anyway. Yeah. But what you do is we, we like to get some cold cuts of meat and some cheeses. Yeah. Fire, fire, you know. oh, like a comfortable kind of little it's, party menu. It's the same stuff that you're going to be... People always overbuy for Christmas. Yeah, so spread it out. So we're spreading it out. So what we're doing is rather than saying, you can't eat that because it's not Christmas yet. You can't eat that Christmas. <laughs> no, it's the beginning of Christmas. So Christmas Eve, and you know you're going to have this big meal the next day. Yeah. If you're lucky, not everybody gets a Christmas dinner, but, you know, I wish everybody in some way does manage to experience some, you know, Form mil of the milk of season, human yeah. kindness on uh, Christmas time. But you have this banquet so it's your own kind of mini banquet yeah in um a reflection of those ancient times and again you can just put some candles there and so people put their photographs up of what they have in their banquets and things and this year will be the first time in several years we haven't had a banquet i think we're going we've been invited out to eat at a restaurant oh so we'll probably okay. we may find ourselves out can i come yes of course yeah hey. <laughs> but it'll be a little family thing a restaurant so that will be our Beowulf Day feast. feast. Yeah. Now, what you can also do is start looking at all those things that are associated with Beowulf. And there's probably a lot of people listening didn't even know are associated with Beowulf. Mm -hmm. So I think that's when we start bringing Beowulf this thousand years to today mm -hmm. as a look at the things that are around us that have been influenced by Beowulf. Now, of course, Beowulf, you have that um, computer-generated Beowulf movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, the 2007 That's right. by Robert Zeme Zemeckis. That's it, uh, which is... Uh, which is called, literally isn't? called Beowulf. Uh, uh, the director's cut is very good. Yeah, the dire I would recommend, if you've not seen it, to watch it on the director's cut. Yes, it has some... I mean, if you're a Beowulf um, aficionado mm. to the actual poem itself... I think it, it hits uh, the theatre a couple of years before Avatar, yeah. first Avatar. Um, and again, it was filmed in 3D. Yeah. So you'll yeah. see people like poking. Uh, it is very good. Spears into the screen, and you think, yeah, yeah that was definitely was was intended to watch it in 3D. It's very good, but it has its downsides. Um, well, I tried to ignore little niggles, yeah. little niggles. It's not really a downside. I still enjoy it's it. It's a film. So the best way to look at the animated one 
is one of the animated ones. One of the, yeah, we're there. we'll get to that. One of the animated ones. This is the computer generated one that has got a full sort of star cast, isn't it? Mm. Who's the main guy? Ah, that would be Ray Winston. Yes, uh, yeah. he's classic because um, it's not just this movie that I find odd choosing the lead character. Um, to be Beowulf, because there's another one that we'll talk about momentarily, but Ray Winston is a good old East Ender, isn't he? I'm here to kill your monster. Yeah. I'm here to kill your monster. Right? I mean, it, it's it's hilarious in, in, the, in that side of things, you know? Um, but it's also got Anthony Hopkins in there. It's, oh, what's, um, what's it? The guy from Red... Oh, John Malkovich. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with him on set. It was... I, was, I was in Red 2. Oh, you know, yeah. And I had a good chat with him. Uh, Helen Mirren was there. It's the bit where she's getting carted off, pretending she's the Queen of England. Aren't, aren't you the guy on the phone? I'm the guy on the in phone. In the, like, asylum <laughs> Yeah, it bit. Got, uh, the scene got cut a, a little bit there, but yes, I was meant to ring the orderlies to come and take her away. Yeah, you do You do see it I, in the movie. I did kind of, a bit of a flash. You do but, see you. But you do see you. Outside of filming, I, I was lucky enough to be there and have a little chat with John Malkovich and uh, he was saying about Helen Mirren in a nice polite way she's, she's completely mad completely mad <laughs> I'm the Queen of England I'm the Queen of England no, that's just the character yeah John Malkovich is great um, it's also got uh, Brendan Gleeson in there Brendan Gleeson yeah uh, is that Weeglaff yeah he plays okay. uh, the, the right hand man to uh, Beowulf Weeglaff um, you've seen him in well, that's so many So movies. many things. Gangs of New York, I think, is in there. Um, Paddington 2. Yes. Because I worked with him on Paddington 2. Yeah, Knuckles. <laughs> Knuckles. I was in, <laughs> in the scenes with him in, this, in the prison. Um, and, of course, you can't escape the fact that it's also got uh, Angelina Jolie. Of course, of course. Um, that's kind of now, where it comes a bit. Kind that's where of... it falls apart for me. Well, don't say fall apart, because we really do love this movie. Yeah, I love the movie because one of the big things I love about that is the soundtrack. Whatever you think dum, about dum, the movie, dum, 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 the soundtrack, dum, it, you can just listen to the... Yeah, it's an epic soundtrack. Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> yeah, if you don't... Even if you don't... <laughs> you calm down, like, If you don't like the movie, you can't not like the soundtrack. It's yeah. such an epic soundtrack. Mm. Um, and when it comes to the drag... Although the, it definitely the, hits that kind of fantasy epic yeah, it's a, as it, feel and, and it's 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 yeah it's the it's the original story chopped up a bit but the, the dragon's good in it i like the dragon dragon's good yeah um angelina jolie as grendel's mother mm, mm. Yeah, not so not so it's, good it's the it's the heels <laughs> it's the, it's it doesn't the quite make sense the stiletto heels well yeah actually um a better movie so moving on from from that one and actually just touching upon the fact that you said it's not the only animated one mm. because there are uh, I know at least in the one other animated one. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, which is like two D animation. Yeah, that's and kind that's... of being a tale being told. Yeah. This John John Hurt had something to do with that. Didn't yeah, he? I do believe. You're that's right. a very that's kind of my one of my favourite yeah. depictions of Grendel because he does seem to be this kind of swampy black demon, demon creature. creature. Um, but so that's that's well worth watching if you can get that. And that is called Beowulf. Just not to make this confusing, but it is called Beowulf, Beowulf again. Um, but uh, to, to distinguish the two, we'll go for Beowulf, the director's yes. cut, uh, 2007. Yes. And then this one is probably came out earlier, I mm -hmm. reckon, uh, with John Hurt. Yes. So this is just Beowulf. Then, talking about Grendel's mum, yep. a far better depiction when it was Beowulf and Grendel. The movie Beowulf and Grendel. Oh, that's the one with, uh, what was it? Oh the, oh, the guy who plays Leonidas. Yes. What's his name? Yeah, that's Gerard Butler. Mm. Okay, and okay, the depiction of Grendel's mother in that movie, really creepy. From from what I recall, it looked kind of like uh, the Meg person from Legend. Yeah, like uh, Knucklebones. Yeah, Meg, Meg Knucklebones, Knucklebones yes. that's it. Much more creepier, much more realistic. Kind of a, a, a water yeah. sea hag. Yeah, much more how you'd imagine. Because she lives down in these uh, water, in these caves deep in the water. And in, in, the, in the story of Beowulf, I mean, again, it's fantasy. So mm. you've got to say, he puts on his, he's still got all his armour on and he swims down to get to her caves I, th I think uh, it has been a while since we've seen yeah, it yeah but he, he swims down in the book you know in the in the poem he swims down he swims and he swims and he swims and he swims and eventually and you kind of imagine yeah, he's full armour <laughs> yeah he reaches it or chain mail or Odin's web and he gets there and he comes out into the cave um, but again it's one of those situations where his sword he's he's given the sword by um, uh, uh, I can't think what the chap's name is from uh, Hrothgar's Nephew, I can't think of his name, but he gives him his sword. But that sword is just useless against. Is in this specific film? Uh, not in this film. I'm talking about just in, in general. In, okay. in Beowulf, okay. 
normal swords won't do anything to Grendel's mother, but there is a sword that is forged by the Titans okay. that's in her treasure hoard. Right. And it can't. it's like a sword so big and, as I say, forged by the Titans at a time long, long, long before you know, that, uh, that he's big enough to be able to wield the sword, and that's what, what Angie slays her with. And again, that kind of brings into the story this whole idea of further back in time to talk about the time it's ancient history ancient history anyway so the depiction in Beowulf and Grendel, and Grendel with um, Gerard Butler Gerard Butler that's it uh, she's much creepier much more like it but then I have an issue with with Grendel, Grendel and his dad yeah because They're kind of they are literally I mean okay the, the prosthetic is not bad but they are uh, shown to be trolls yeah, so but, not, but they're not particularly imposing. They're not imposing. Yes, they're big, but really they're kind of like ne- just Neanderthal cavemen. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and it's his son that uh, is Grendel that comes back. They uh, kind of changed the, um, how his arm gets pulled off in yeah, that one a bit, didn't know, they? Yeah. Uh, it's a, if you watch the movie again, mm. or anybody who's familiar with it, it's got a very small cast. Yeah. You know, you don't yeah. see many people in it. I mean, it's nicely... Played. There's a few recognisable faces. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think who plays um, Hrothgar. Oh, yes, that's uh, Stellan Stasgard. Skasgard. Not Stasgard. Skasgard, that's it. So he's the father of... Um, Bill Skasgard. Bill Skasgard. And somebody else. There's, yeah. a, there's so many Skasgards. So, <laughs> there's a lot. And they're all great. Um, so, yeah, he's uh, he's Hrothgar. And it's still a good... It's a good movie. A lot mm. of people like that. Um, but again, I have a problem with Gerard Butler being Beowulf because he's got this really thick Scottish accent. So, <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> there you've got the East End accent. Yeah. We all geats. We all geats. I'm here to kill your monster. And then you switch over to the Scottish accent, you know, <laughs> Beowulf. Um, so, but not all is finished there because there are so there many. Are there are a lot. There are a so lot. So let's, let's roll some of these off. The worst one is the one with. Christopher Lambert. Christopher Lambert, Highlander himself. It's a it's a bit of an odd one that it's kind of like almost post apocalyptic yeah, in it, some it, ways. I think it's set in a post apocalyptic world. Yeah. And Grendel is it's kind of like a ghosty is an animated demon. demon. And yeah. then his mum, it's I don't even know how to describe that. Yeah. But the, it's just something to be watched. The story plot and the acting is Awful. I mean, he's got like dual wield crossbows, yeah. I'm sure, and there's like this giant um, cutthroat razor yeah, used as like a guillotine, guillotine at one point. Yeah, you've got like it's almost like you've got the road warriors from Mad Max Two. Yeah, are, yeah, 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 yeah. It is one of those ones that just has to be seen to be believed. Yeah. Uh, once watched, I don't know if you watch it again. I want to kind of track it down. That way, should be really cool. Yeah. Uh, another great one, which is based mm. on Beowulf. Yeah. Is 13th Warrior. Oh, really? You didn't know that was Beowulf? I did not know that. Yeah, that's based on the 13th Warrior. Oh, wow. It's based on Beowulf. Well, you have the big, um, you know... The, the, the fire the, serpent. Yeah, you've got the fire serpent coming down out the hill. Like you've got this, kind you? of that... Of course, because you've got that kind of lady who's in the caves. Yes, it's kind of Grendel's mother, isn't it? Kind of, but what what it is is their meat hall keeps getting attacked by it does, creep, Yeah, Yeah, it does. And... Um, and I'd never considered that. It's basically yes, and then the fireworm. You know, don't do this as you will uh, you know, you'll disturb the fireworm, and of course, a, wor- a worm, a worm is a dragon. So, mm. uh, and and of course, you have got the thirteen mm. warriors, mm. and um, uh, what's his name? Antonio Banderas. Banderas is the thirteenth warrior, which is also throwing yourself back to Tolkien again. It's the twelve dwarfs and, and Bilbo, Bilbo, Bilbo Baggins. Or, wow. Sorry, Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's really cool. You know, that is but, actually really cool. And, of course, you've got the big, uh, I can't think of his name, but the big Viking leader of the Warriors is basically Beowulf. In it. Are you talking about the guy with the blonde, blonde hair. hair? The blonde hair, yeah. He's in you a know. few things. He's in um, a few things. Yeah, so, yeah, so that is another I one. had not, because we're going to have to watch that. <laughs> so I, saw, I saw that being promoted <clears throat> on uh, Facebook a few days ago. Yeah, that, that's based on uh, a lot of Beowulf in that. That's really cool. Other other films, uh, we were talking about another Skazgard now. Obviously, The Northman. Yes, and that's uh, that's another one which, it's a different depiction. Different depiction. It has, it, it, it certainly has connections to Beowulf. It, it it kind of takes away almost that kind of fantasy element of having the demons, and the kind of Beowulf character that you do follow is mm-hmm. is kind of the thing plaguing but the village. The thing I like about that movie, although it's not strictly Beowulf, it has got that. It's 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 both depicting real life mm. and the 
North, yeah, the Norse uh, mythology. Mythology, yeah, because you know he, very well he's having visions and yeah, seeing things. That's right, and um, and he goes into a, a, a an ancient uh, burial mound to re- retrieve a sword. You know, that's yeah. very reminiscent. I always think, sort of think that's reminiscent of Conan the Barbarian when Schwarzenegger finds his sword. It is. It yeah, is. It belongs to Crom. Crom. But more onto the Beowulf movies. Of course, you have Outlander. Outlander. Are we not talking about the time travelling Amazon series? In Scotland. No, we're talking about the film Outlander, Outlander. which also has John Hurt in it. It does. And who plays Hrothgar? Yes. And they have Herot, the The Mead Hall. Hall. It is very clearly Beowulf in everything except the name. And the fact that it is science fiction. Yep, it is. It's Vikings. It is, it is. Because obviously a a ship crashed down on Earth. The main character is. An alien, an alien, an alien, space. and on his ship, on his ship, there's a, a beast, which a is Morwin, a Morwin who, which they describe as a dragon, dragon. and uh, that's what's the it kind of takes that kind of beastly role, and that's what's attacking Herot. There is a little twist in there that makes it more Beowulfy, mm. obviously, because there's more than one. Oh, spoilers! <laughs> kind of a bit, a bit, a bit, but uh, and it's also got Ron Perlman in there as well, which is yeah, brilliant. oh, he's always good in everything. <laughs> Ron Perlman is good, so that's another Beowulf. One. But uh, that's a good twist one. That one, I yeah. actually quite like it because it's nice to have kind of that sci-fi element thrown in. Yeah, uh, well, that was well, that one. I enjoy watching that because that's mm. what I mean. You can watch a Beowulf movie, and unless you're an absolute purist mm. and go, oh no, 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 that's not Beowulf, that's not Beowulf. Um, yeah, you've got to enjoy all these things for what they are. Yeah, of course. Um, because is, is there really a perfect depiction in film of Beowulf? No, there isn't. They have had a Beowulf TV series, and I thought that was absolutely atrocious. But oh, like, yeah, I remember. That was on BBC, wasn't it? was it? BBC. Um, again, I thought the main lead in that just wasn't mm. big enough and strong enough to be Beowulf. It's a bit like watching, I mean, no disrespect to Tom Cruise in Re- Jack Reacher. Oh, the, yeah, but, those films. But, yeah. you know, they're good action movies. Mm. But you need to watch the it's Amazon, isn't it? We have Reacher on. Yeah. And then and now the Amazon series Reacher, he depicts the he's character. He's basically dwarfed. He de- he depicts the character that's actually in the books. Yeah. You far know? far better. Yeah. You know, he's what, six foot four, six foot five. He's stacked. <laughs> stacked. You know, uh, Tom Tom Cruise, love you, man, but it's not quite Jack getting, Reacher. Getting people to stay on boxes is, is a bit lame. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, back to Beowulf. There is another depiction of the film which pops to mind, and that is Grendel, The Legend of Beowulf. Do you remember that? Uh, that was a, that was the very low budget one. Very low budget. On one. the front cover of the box, it has Beowulf the wearing the massive Viking horns, horns that do not appear in the film whatsoever. No. Uh, I remember there was kind of like. Was that where there was kind of like? It was quite heavily, I think heavily people, animated. Uh, trolley, trolley people in it. Trolley people trying to be trolls. Oh. Mm. All I can remember is possibly either a badly CGI'd Grendel's mum or a like a badly CG dragon in that. Yeah, I'm um I'm gonna have to watch that again. <laughs> so unless anybody listening has uh, you know of a Beowulf based movie that we haven't mentioned. Yeah, we would love to know. We'd really, to know. really, that yeah. is actually really interesting. Exactly. We would love to know that. Please yeah. comment below. Comment below or email, you know, to Zatwell Productions. Yes, Just of go course. to the website, get the email address and bang an email over and let us know. But yeah, there, there are, and I'm sure there'll be more. Mm. I'm sure there'll be more. And, of course, my my desire would be for a film producer out there, film director, to take this epic story. Mm-hmm. And as I say, the, the Beowulf, the character and the adventures are equal to any kind of superhero thing we have. Mm. And, and you could take M- it... Much out. like, okay, uh, comparison to, like, we've said in the past that... The Eastern kind of martial arts movies are their superheroes. They're their superheroes, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you've got somebody who's running across water and or fighting by balancing on blades of uh, bamboo, yeah, you know, it's because they're superheroes. Yeah, yeah. It's not because they're somehow you've trained in Eastern martial arts to reach this amazing level of, you know, yeah. skill. It's because mm. they are their superheroes. superheroes. Yeah. Um, and Beowulf is one of our Anglo-Saxon. It is a hero. Scandinavian, a great he- hero. Hero, and. Um, so I'd love for somebody to take it and make a movie mm-hmm. as epic as what Peter Jackson did with Lord, Lord, of, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Ooh, that would be you cool. Know, because, that would be cool. And maybe one day it'll happen. I do think there is scope for a really good version of Beowulf. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, which... yeah, we had The Northman. That <clears throat> was pretty darn good. Oh, I love that pretty movie. Pretty darn good, yeah. That's probably one of my best kind of Viking movies that's been uh, released Well, the, there was a lot of critics saying it was far too masculine. Yeah, but that's the thing. It was based... <laughs> a lot of it was based on how you would imagine, historically... The, Vikings to be. The, the, the Scandinavian culture to live day by day. Yeah. You know, and that, it, was, it was just depicting... What, that, what what would be a good attempt at historical correctness? Yeah, at, at a time where yes, everything was. Very, you can't you yeah. can't view these things through modern eyes. No, no, you really can't. You can't. But I would love to see Beowulf done to that kind of degree. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think it'd be super. So anyway, Beowulf Day, it is a day of celebration of the epic tale of Beowulf, and it's an excuse to have a feast, mm-hmm. to sit around fire, drink. Mead. Oh, yes. You know, if you can get your hands on some mead, mead. you're going to have mead. mead. Mead! To quote a Beowulf movie. Beowulf. <laughs> John Malkovich. <laughs> um, you need to, and if you're going to drink mead, now this is coming from years and years of experience of uh-huh. sitting around campfires drinking yep. mead, heat it up. Now, the best way to do that, back in the old days, a lot of the mead that we used to buy had corks in the bottles. Mm-hmm. And you could put the mead bottle, which is glass, so health and safety warnings here, be very careful. We used to put the glass bottle next to the fire Mm -hmm. and as the mead inside got hotter and hotter, the pressure would push the cork up until it went and shot out. Well, as soon as the cork popped, take that out, pour it into your mead horns, make sure it's in a vessel that's not going to smash because you don't want to pour it into a glass. (laughs) hot, Um, So you pour it out and it's basically steaming. And it's usually steaming even more if you're outside because it's the cold weather. Tastes beautiful. Far Mead tastes far better warm or mm. hot than it does when it's cold. I know. Is this going to like cue a, a mead podcast? <laughs> yeah. However, yeah, maybe we should do a mead tasting. However, with mead, the most ancient of, of, of drinks, as uh, to quote uh, The World's End, was it? The King Arthur of beers. The King Arthur of beers, exactly. <laughs> so if you're going to heat your mead... I mean, you could pour it out of the bottle into a pan, heat it up on your cooker. But if you're going to do it with a glass bottle, most means these days come with a twist cap. Mm. So you want to break that seal, undo the cap, and just put it on just a tiny little bit so that the bottle can breathe and heat your mead up by the fire. Keep an eye on it. Don't go picking the bottle up with your hand because it will probably be really, really hot and burn yourself. So always have... Uh, cloth, leather glove. A gauntlet. A gauntlet. I was going to get a gauntlet. It went from cloth to leather glove, and then you jumped in with the gauntlet. Um, to be able to share that mead. Enjoy your mead, enjoy the fire, the dark night, and the coming of the winter festival. Don't celebrate it in one day. Start with Beowulf Day and go all the way through until the chiming of midnight on New Year's Day. And then the new year has begun. Properly, because on New Year's Day, that's the last feast of the season. You know, you've gone from the first feast on Beowulf Day, you have your Christmas feast, and then you're obviously usually eating lots more on uh, Boxing Day because you've got all the leftovers, and mm-hmm. then you might be travelling around and seeing family or family coming to you. and thing. You have more feasts, more feasts, all the way through, and then you get to New Year's Eve, and you have your big party. Woohoo! Happy New Year! You know, old Lang Syne and all that. And then the first feast of the new year on New Year's Day. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you get to midnight, well, that's the end of the winter festival because the new year has begun. And mm-hmm. let's face it, we're all back to work for proper. Boo. 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 But we all. So enjoy the festive season we, while it lasts. We all look back and go. Make the most of every moment. Thank the Norse gods for Beowulf Day. Oh, yes. <laughs> Are you going to be celebrating Beowulf Day this year, listeners? Let us know. We would love to know. However, this is not, this is the penultimate podcast as we come to a close. Of 2023. We That's still have it. one more to go. One more to go. Our festive Christmas party. That's it. That's going to be next week, so stay tuned we've for got that. special guests coming in. So stay tuned. Won't tell you about it, but we've got special guests and it's our... Sapwell Productions. Our epic festive season party. Well, now we know show Christmas party. But a round off, we have, as always... The Magical Mystery Hat. The Magical Mystery Hat. The Sherlock Holmes, Holmes. Hat of Mystery. That's what we should maybe have some... Uh, 
some Viking armour to go with it this week. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. I should get a Viking helmet to yes. put all these options in. Well, maybe next time. That's yeah. Right. Well, next time we'll switch the... Sherlock Holmes can have his deer stalker back and mm-hmm. we'll bring in Beowulf's helm. <laughs> yeah, we do have one of those. We do have we one. Do have one. <laughs> so, uh, on so the dwindling amount of topics for our well, exclusive you're, episodes... You're standing in front of me in the dungeon studio shaking yep. that hat. So, yep. it can only mean one thing, that one I've, got thing. To, I've got to dive in there. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you've got to dive into the right, hat roll. of mystery to pick roll. out the subject for our next exclusive episode, which will be available for our patrons and YouTube members. Right, my sleeve is being rolled up. Okay, are you ready? My hand is going in. Okay. Are we ready? It might bite. Three, two, one, it's in. I'm <laughs> rummaging. I'm rub- oh, yeah. no, it's... The hat of mystery is it's biting, biting you. Me. I've got one, I've got one. Okay, got one. what's it going to be? What's it going to be? Oh, there we go. Is it going to be traumatic for me again? Can you guess from the episode? Okay. It's episode 11. 11? Ooh, 11. Ooh. Ooh. Folklore. Folklore. Oh, was that... Um, it's one of our folklore ones. Hartf- Hartfordshire, Hartfordshire folklore. Hartfordshire folklore. Well, let's say folklore in general. That's actually quite good. So yeah, I like that. I like that. That's a good so a I'll good look, one to pick I'll, out on this particular episode. I look episode. forward to uh, having a little bit of a, a reminiscence over and, and catch up on folklore. And possibly we can talk about another folklore episode that we're going to do in the future. Of course. I'm looking forward to that. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe to this channel and comment below any suggestions of topics or activities you'd like to listen to in future episodes. That's a big... Are you the one they call Beowulf? <laughs> Goodbye from Zach. <laughs> and that's a... I'm here to kill your monster. Goodbye from Buzz. Happy Beowulf Day, everyone! Happy Beowulf Day! You can find the Now We Know Show podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music and Apple Podcasts. Keep up to date with everything ZWP on Facebook and Instagram or visit the Zach Wild Productions website at www.zachwildproductions.com. And remember to join us on Patreon or become a YouTube member for early access content and exclusive episodes.